Hi, everybody. We are going to be live with Jeff Mallory in approximately five minutes. We hope you stay tuned in. We're going to be talking a little bit about Jeff, where he comes from, where he's going, um, diversity and inclusion in education, and so much more. So please stay tuned. We'll talk to you in about five minutes.
Hi, everybody. Sorry about that. We were having some technical difficulties. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we are here with Jeff Mallory. Hey, Jeff, thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So, Jeff, I actually met Jeff through our uh, charity basketball event, which was a great time to um, first meet you. Um, Jeff, at the time, worked at Duquesne um, in the Center for Diversity and Inclusion, and now he is the executive vice president, right, at St. Vincent College. That's correct. That's my alma mater. That is awesome. Well, we are definitely happy to have you today. Um, Jeff has received a number of awards. I'm going to put his his link uh, for LinkedIn down below, and we'll put a little bio up as well. Um, Jeff, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about where you come from? Thank you. So first and foremost, Melanie, uh, a special thanks to you uh, for our friendship and for your leadership in Pittsburgh, and of course, to uh, the Hispanic Chamber uh, here in Pittsburgh. So I really appreciate to be here, but a little bit about myself. I'm from a small farming community in rural southwestern Virginia, a town called Bedford. Uh, it's the size of about 7,000 people. Uh, I came here to St. Vincent in the early 2000s and uh, decided to stay. And I've been here since with the, uh, uh, besides a short stint uh, overseas uh, in Spain. But uh, we come from a small community. Uh, we've been in much larger places in life. And uh, for me, uh, coming to St. Vincent, like I said, in the early 2000s, really changed the trajectory for me. I, I think it changed the generation uh, when we think of education and what it did for our family. And we didn't know that back in the early 2000s, but if we fast forward here almost 20 years later, uh, we've accomplished a lot. And a lot of that's due to us taking uh, some chances uh, at an early age in life and it paying off um, you know, down the road. So tell us a little bit about your family. And you talked about that educational background. Was your family very big on education? What was the, <laughs> my kids are here. Um, <laughs> what, what was that like growing up in your small town? Yeah. So my family, the background, the dynamics are my grandparents, both of them worked a combined 70 years in a rubber factory. And uh, at that time, and, and still to this day, that's the apex of what a lot of people can do in the town where I come from. And I don't negate that that's what they did, but that was kind of the expectation uh, for many people in the city. So the thought of leaving that town we were in uh, for many generations of my family never crossed their mind uh, that they would traverse outside of that city. Uh, so it's a city that uh, quite frankly, as a youth in fourth and fifth grade, I noticed a disturbing trend of a lot of student athletes that were acclaimed in the papers and local media that one or two years later, they'd be on the streets or they wouldn't really have a sustainable path in front of them. And I noticed that as early as third grade. And uh, for me, it was a conscientious, conscientious decision uh, at a young age to really break that norm. Uh, my family though, is, is a family of great love and fortitude uh, in many ways. And I think uh, that love that we have for each other, uh, I can't ever think of a time, at least my grandparents and my parents ever disrespected anybody and they would do their best they could do uh, to help people. And I think that's what really helped me at a young age look outside the normal range um, in terms of aspirations of, of the town where I come from. That's awesome. Well, you talked a little bit about um, a little bit about basketball. So when did you first start playing basketball? So I first started playing basketball. It's a great question. Uh, I'll get nostalgic about answering it. Uh, when I was eight years old, I had a neighbor across the street from me who was at a yard sale, uh, knew I liked basketball. Uh, so the neighbor across the street, uh, we had had a bad storm. I had knocked down a, a locust tree and a locust tree uh, with a yard sale backboard is how I learned how to play basketball. Uh, neither one of my parents were really uh, involved in athletics. And so the fact that I picked basketball at, at the year of eight, uh, the year of eight, uh, and that I was eventually a professional and was able to see my brother behind me become a professional. Uh, it talks to you about the power of sports. It also talks uh, perhaps at the point of how I've used basketball as a vessel and a vehicle for change, especially when it comes to uh, impact in future youth uh, in their respective endeavors. And how do you think that that team atmosphere plays into your career and what you do today and how you've evolved as an individual? Oh, that's a great question. I, I think it's, uh, it's manifested itself in many ways. 
I think when you're used to being a part of a team, naturally you're more inclined uh, to work together. Uh, you're inclined to really tackle some steep challenges together. And I think uh, it's just what you learn about uh, each other in a process. And so now I think if you fast forward to the role I'm in, there's not a moment during my day where I'm not looking at it from a collaborative uh, aspect of how do we bring people in to look at the challenges we're going through? Uh, how can they be a critical part of the solutions? But I think if you think uh, about how we work, uh, we work pretty long hours. We have to uh, maintain that at a pretty uh, high clip. So I don't have an issue, of course, working late, uh, working early in the morning. And I think there's also an appreciativeness of it too. When you're beside somebody who's going through the same things you are, uh, you appreciate uh, that you can share in such a moment uh, with somebody else. Even if they're not seven foot tall like me, they're still a critical part of that team, so. Well, you know, that's funny because when we first talked, you know, I had seen you on LinkedIn, I had seen you on Facebook, but when we met in person, I was like, okay <laughs> you know it's, it's it's that something you know i heard i i met someone who was even taller than you and he said that's always the first thing people ask me when they meet me they say how tall are you and did you play basketball is that something you experience yeah it is and i and i it's a good it's a good question as well because i uh it gets to a point i had a conversation with my dad some years ago and he says jeff you can look at it one or two ways you're not going to shrink that much uh, anytime soon but he said, you have an opportunity to use yourself as a prism. And I think that was a great analogy. So I, I don't think there's a space I can go to, at least in Pittsburgh or the region uh, where somebody won't remember me. But I also think it's an opportunity to make sure uh, in a humble way, I'm not a chameleon. And I try to pride myself, even though I'm seven foot tall and, and being the same person in every space that you go to. Now there's different things you have to accomplish in each one of those spaces I alluded to. Uh, but I take great pride in being this tall. I don't slouch over. Uh, obviously, I have to watch my head uh, wherever I go. Um, but I think it's special, you know, to be this tall and to be healthy and and to kind of stand out to a degree. I think that helps us uh, accomplish some things, uh, both professionally and personally as well. Yeah, that's that's one thing that we talked about throughout this was um, you always using your platform for good. And that's something we're going to continue to highlight. But I want to talk just a little bit more about youth sports since they, it has been something that has impacted your life so much. What do you think is the importance for parents and for even young children to make sure that families are involved in these types of programs? It's critically important. I mean, you know, I think any young or aspiring, you know, student athlete, so much can be accomplished through sports. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think of what they're going through, uh, you know, of course, there's the end of, 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 of probably a poor home life or some things there they need that they need. Um, but I think it teaches you, it teaches you so much at a young age. Uh, you learn how to work together. You learn how to, you know, be physically fit. You learn how to be a part of a team. And I think sometimes, you know, I would just encourage parents to be vulnerable. Um, you know, if they're around a coach who really cares about your son or daughter, uh, you can't ask for anything better. And I can think back vividly to coaches when I was, you know, eight, nine and 10 years old and how they poured into me. And I think I've been adamant about expressing my appreciation as I get older uh, for that. But sports can be a vessel. Uh, it can it can literally save lives, uh, but it can also teach you some really uh, outstanding qualities about yourself uh, through simply playing sports, which is beautiful. Well, I think that that is really amazing. And we hear so many stories like that of when people started things as children and they kind of grew into that. How did basketball help you transition from, you know, small, small town life to college life? You know, it put us on a level playing field. You know, when you go to basketball, you have a job to do any court that you step on. Uh, so my brother right now plays in Melbourne, Australia. And I played in Spain, um, you know, when I was done at St. Vincent. And it's still the same game. You know, it's still the same tasks, uh, still the same objectives. Now, I guess where we laid our head at night was different. Uh, you know, me being in a Spanish-speaking country, which I absolutely loved every minute of, and my brother being in Australia. Um, but, you know, the, the sport of basketball, it, it gave us an opportunity. Uh, it didn't matter where we went. We had an opportunity to get better at the game we love. We had an opportunity to see the world. Uh, and it also gave us an opportunity that perhaps we would not have had uh, if we would not have pursued basketball. And um, I'm very respectful to the game for what it's done. It's changed my life. Uh, but I was also grateful that I gave it everything I had as a student athlete 
uh, going to this point now as a coach giving back to youth in our community, um, I, it's very important uh, for me to carve out that time to give back to a game that's literally changed uh, my life and, and the trajectory of my family as well. Oh my gosh, was my, when I off mute. You were. I'm so sorry, guys. I actually had some problems with childcare today. So my kids are here and let's talk about that a little bit. That can be really stressful. So today, um, my kids weren't going to be here. My son was going to be doing school. Um, and instead, here we are. They've kind of been running in and grabbing things. I've been trying to mute. Um, yeah, they're smearing things everywhere. What's been your experience with working from home and working with kids and trying to balance and just not be stressed about it? Well, well let me be honest here. I, I, the credit goes to my wife, Amy. Uh, my wife, Amy, is a school teacher. She teaches junior high math here in Latrobe. Has been doing a, a great job at that for such a long time and is an, is an inspiration uh, to me as an, as an educational administrator. Uh, but we have kids, we have uh, uh, Kate is seven, Brooke is five and Reed is three. And you talk about the home life and the transition, um, you know, you, you gotta, you have to do what you can do and control what you can control. So I was really non-apologetic uh, when, when our, um, when our loved ones or our kids would show up during conference calls and, and those kind of things, because that's the life we live. Uh, and they're a critical part uh, of my life. And, and I try to be honest with anybody we're interacting with. And so it was a challenge. I think we carved out spaces in the house uh, thinking that would uh, alleviate some issues, but, um, there's no greater joy than having your son or daughter come and want to climb on you. And, um, but it's also an opportunity to share, uh, something different about you with other people that they might not see uh, in a professional setting. So. Yeah. Well, and during this pandemic, I think that stress is also something. Why don't you tell us how your job and how you manage stress with all of these different things going on. I think we know that I'm not managing stress well this morning. <laughs> no, I think you're doing a great job. I think you're handling it pretty well. And I can oh, probably get some cues from, some cues from that. Uh, it, it changed dramatically. I think uh, you, you saw us in the educational space within three days have to go remote. And you're talking of institutions that are 140, 150, even 200 years old that have kind of operated in one way. And how do you shift that literally in three or four days? And uh, I'd be remiss to say that, you know, I think we did well uh, across the board uh, for certain higher education institutions. I think other ones, uh, including us, you know, we always have something we can learn from that and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Uh, I think for us, it was uh, at least when I was at Duquesne, it was reaffirming of how much our work continued and how much little change we needed to do when it came to the phone calls that were still coming in, especially from our students, the alumni, it showed us or it gave us validation, I guess I could say in a, in a respectful way that we had done relationships the right way. Uh, that if it was via Zoom, it was different. We weren't in person now, uh, but we were still able to move um, forward uh, the needs of those constituents that came with us. Now the stress, um, you can have some pretty unhealthy habits, I'll be honest, from sitting uh, remote and, and doing that. And so we had to make sure we carved out time to be physically fit uh, carve out time to sometimes, you know, postpone a meeting and just collect your thoughts. And it's nothing wrong with that as well. So I've been blessed with some great mentors. I've, I've learned some things from them, uh, many, many years over, um, that has definitely added value to, to our lives and definitely helped me personally, um, through this unique situation that the whole world, uh, quite frankly, finds itself in. It's so funny because it is, we can all, <laughs> we can all identify with the, I didn't mute and yelled at my kids, right? <laughs> um, That's um, no, I think during these times it has been so important to pivot. And I know that your role at the universities have helped a lot of people through different things, maybe not to this scale until now. Um, but I want to thank you for everything that you do for the community and for the students. Um, but before we get there, I want to hear a little bit more um, about your experience in going to Spain. How did that come about and what? how was it to make that decision to leave to live in another country for the first time? Yeah, I'll, I'll walk us through that. And in 2006, I had um, done pretty well playing. I was eligible for the NBA draft um, and I was not drafted. I didn't think I, I would be based on some things. I think I, I'd maximize my opportunities here at St. Vincent. Uh, which was a full scholarship program at that time. 
Um, but when you're in the draft, you're automatically on a, on a different kind of radar. If you're if you're qualified enough or have potential to potentially try out, um, you know, other people catch wind. And that's what happened here is that I had an agent in Rome who had caught wind that I was at a workout with Toronto and uh, literally on draft night uh, within an hour of the draft concluding, uh, I started getting calls right away of opportunities that presented themselves. And uh, the best one that came about was in Cordoba, Spain, uh, which is about an hour, two hours south of Madrid in the southern part of Spain. And I signed a, a two year deal uh, right out of the gate uh, with the team. And it's, the size of the city is comparable to Pittsburgh. Um, the cultural dialect and differences were something that kind of take, took me back. And I and I'd shared that I'd been in the class and I'd taken Spanish classes uh, here at St. Vincent, thought I was really well prepared. I forgot, though, that uh, when you land in, in countries, depending on the region you're in, there's a different dialect that also compounds uh, on top of the actual language. So in this case, uh, I had teammates that would be uh, the majority from the south, southern part of Spain, and I had a few from the northern part, and there were distinct differences in how they spoke. And uh, for me, uh, I remember landing, and I remember within the first um, four or five hours of me landing, in Spain, I had uh, another American teammate, and, and he um, right away said that he was not going to really acclimate to the Spanish culture. And for me, I went the complete opposite way uh, based on where I was born and how I was raised. I wanted to know and infuse myself in that culture as quick as I could and as best I could. And I shared this example of my first trip to the store as an athlete who has many things taken care of uh, for him when he landed. I had a pocket dictionary. Uh, that I carried with me to the store for at least the first two months because I thought it would be extremely uh, disrespectful for me not to even have eye contact with a Spanish citizen and for me to not even try to engage them. Uh, and it taught me a very important life lesson from that point forward is that you should appreciate the cultures you find yourself in, give them the respect and also challenge yourself, uh, which quite frankly, if I didn't do that, uh, that's how I got into higher education was through that uh, experience in Spain. So that that's such a different experience than I feel like a lot of the people who are watching now, I think because, you know, we're the Hispanic Chamber, so many people have this experience where they come to this culture, they come to the U.S. from these other countries. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you think that might compare and especially with the language? What is it like to have a language barrier? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's humbling. It can be scary depending on who you are. Uh, for me, uh, Melanie, I thought it was an extreme opportunity. Uh, it was an opportunity to learn a language. I never thought I'd have the ability to, to be in a culture and be immersed in. Um, and so it was a quick decision. I, I think that it's, it's humbling though. It, it made me think back to college teammates. I had a majority of, were, of them were from Eastern Europe and how they came to St. Vincent in particular and, and the physical location of where it is and how they adjusted so seamlessly. And I look back on that uh, when I was in Spain and said they did have some issues and maybe we didn't realize it. And uh, it, it just teaches you a lesson of the importance of, of being humble, uh, the importance of having perhaps a growth mindset and also uh, looking at where you are uh, physically in the world. Um, you know, I think people can dictate depending on where you are and the city you're in, if you look at numbers and metrics, how it should be. Uh, but I think you also have an opportunity to negate some of that and build your niche and, um, you know, be different, be different in that space, too. So I think there's, you can challenge yourself uh, when you're when you're faced to have to go into another kind of culture. Yeah, and that's something that really you can make a choice to do every every day. Um, and in the setting that you're in, in the current educational setting, can you talk a little bit how there are different cultures within that? Yeah, I mean, there, there's there's all kinds of cultures depending on um, how you arrive in a higher ed. I think if you look from a personnel standpoint, you have tendencies and things that you've done uh, from your background uh, that will let you add certain values to the, the, the community you're part of. I think if we talk about the backgrounds of where you're from, are you coming in as a student athlete? Are you within, let's say, five minutes from the St. Vincent College campus community? That's going to look different uh, depending on who you are. And I think that we have to ensure that we understand uh, where anybody, not just students, but anybody in your campus culture or community uh, and beyond higher ed, you have to understand um, where they're coming from 
you know, what are the tendencies? I think as quick as we can, uh, as we are to attract uh, students here, I'm just as quick to say, how soon can I learn uh, that much more about you? Because uh, you have a uniqueness about you that we need to extract and perhaps use when it comes to developing you and helping you uh, matriculate through, uh, especially if you're a student uh, in higher ed. So what was your your journey to higher ed? First of all, what did you go to school for? So my undergraduate uh, degree, Melanie, is in public policy analysis, which is um, a mix mm -hmm. of um, poly, political science and economics. And my master's degree is, um, is an MBA with a focus on operational excellence, which uh, the short of it is streamlining businesses and making your practices more efficient in the workplace. And uh, my terminal degree, uh, my doctorate degree is in educational leadership uh, with the focus on, uh, I looked at minority student transitions and how, they and how they're retained and how I read across the board. Well, yeah, that's exactly what you're doing now. But yeah. when you first started and you were a student, what path did you originally see? Uh, to be honest, I was just thankful that I was uh, going to college uh, to begin with. You know, I was the first grandkid of, of 13 um, to graduate, you know, from college. So I was, I yeah, thought I would be public policy. I uh, shared that the first two summers, uh, my dad is uh, was in the Department of Defense. In the first two summers, I had an internship at the Pentagon where I thought I would do something uh, within the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, basketball, and of course, me and my future wife um, uh, came into play there with that. Uh, but I thought it would be something with government, and um, I find myself, you know, with public policy. I was always intrigued by government. I've been intrigued by economics uh, as a child, and it was a nice mix for me uh, at that point in my life. And so when you were in school, when you first graduated with your bachelor's degree, I think there's always this pull of, do I go work? Do I go back to school? What led you in the direction that you went? Uh, you know, sports, you know, sports dictated what I did after college. And I, I, I thought there might be a glimmer of that going into my senior year. Uh, I had a really productive time on the floor uh, from being somebody who enrolled here at St. Vincent and perhaps didn't know if, if I could make it. Uh, I thought f five years later uh, with a redshirt year, an additional year to, to develop, uh, I thought it was just uh, telling how much had really clicked, how much had happened. But that also showed how much support uh, had happened here uh, at the college too and, and support from many people that to this day I'm thankful of. Um, but yeah, basketball dictated uh, what I would do and, and it was an opportunity that was unique to me. Um, and it, it was an opportunity for us to set a different path. And I looked at it from a family decision. I could have easily went home. I could have easily went and pursued a full-time job. But I think when you're, uh, we have an opportunity such as basketball, which is so unique, you're not going to get that when you're 45 years old and you've been sitting around for a while. I thought I had to at least give it all I could. And, um, you know, one of few around the world that can say they did that as a professional, but I'm also humble enough to know, you know, what that gave me and what that allowed me to do um, fast moving forward. So when you were in college, I want to kind of focus a little bit on the students. If we're talking about higher education. I like to talk about the perspective of the students and how they can look at you and see themselves in you. So what is a major hurdle that you had um, through your college years and how did you overcome it? Uh, you might, I somebody might get a chuckle out of this. My wife uh, kids me and I think it's true. I would not have ordered a pizza in college. I was lucky that I was a part of a basketball program. Um, I really wasn't out of my shell. I was I was there to play basketball to a large degree. I uh, thought that would be the case. Obviously, the Benedictine monks here and their presence and influence on me as a practicing Catholic has come full circle. Uh, the confidence, though, I think, you know, when you don't have many in your family who went to higher ed, it's, it's foreign territory. You don't know what to expect. Uh, you're living on faith to a large degree. You're living on the support that you've gotten or received. My, both of my parents are high. They have higher education degrees. I was lucky in that regard, but I still think being seven or eight hours from home uh, with nobody really connected to this region, it was a leap. And it was a leap that obviously we were prepared to do it. Um, but, you know, it could have went a different way, right? I think many students come and, and they don't know what they want to be. They still don't know what they want to do when they graduate. I consider myself very lucky. Um, 
that I figured it out along the way before I was in a cap and gown as an undergraduate. And what gave you that passion specifically for helping students? I know we talked a little bit about your work at Duquesne and how you first got into that. Can you share some of that with the people watching? Yeah, I can. My mom's an educator. She teach, uh, She taught high school. Uh, she taught special needs uh, students. And I vividly remember stories of her when I was younger. Uh, she would tell me she would traverse uh, the, the, the high school campus and students that were picked on a bully, uh, she would stand in for them. She would recount what happened. Uh, she wouldn't just brush it off. And I think as a child, when you notice that you notice that as an educator, uh, you know that the potential you can have and the impact you can have on somebody. That was a baseline for me at a young age was how my mom in particular treated uh, the youth that were in front of her. Uh, she had always told me, Jeff, you know, somebody's child coming to you in an educational setting is the highest privilege you can have. Uh, is to mold and shape them and to stand alongside them, not talk at them, not talk to them, but to truly understand where they are. And the other piece is I shared that story of when I was eight or nine to play basketball, I've shared the story about the town I came from and how it let some people down. And I very much have this image of a silhouette from the town that I'm from of, of those who were let down. And I sometimes see those silhouettes with certain students um, and want to ensure that they're not going to be in that same vein. So I have an, I have an unbelievable, unwavering passion uh, for student development. I love everything they bring uh, into the campus community. I love knowing every single detail about them, good, bad, or other. Uh, I think at a minimum, that's what I can do, and, and that's what at least I can control uh, in my leadership. Well, from the things that I've heard, you are doing an excellent job and you've touched so many lives. Um, can you share one of your favorite success stories with us? Yeah, I can. I, uh, it's, it's a story and I'll, um, I'll use the pseudonym. Uh, James will be the name I'll use today. But James is, is, is from Aliquippa. Uh, James is a student that I crossed paths with about five years ago. Uh, and James had a semester where it was a uh, point, it was a 1.3 GPA. The next semester was a 0 0.08 uh, as a freshman. And um, at that point, I thought that it was likely he would be asked to transition uh, directly from the university. Um, and I vividly remember that they had informed me a letter was on its way, uh, pretty much stating he was going to be dismissed. And I actually started to call another institution in Pittsburgh to make sure he had a transition because I I uh, gleaned that there were some home life balance issues and there was just some respect issues in his household. And, and for me, uh, at that point, I realized I was much more than an educator. Uh, I was somebody he looked up to. I was somebody he confided in, somebody he trusted, somebody he knew that if he would call, um, they, he would get an answer. And I thought that was uh, everything that he needed. Uh, but fast forward, I, I told the administration at, at Duquesne at that time uh, to give him a chance. I said, I'll step in, do everything I can do to help him. And uh, James, the next semester, uh, with a shock to everyone, produced a 3.1 GPA. And James, fast forward now, is at another higher education institution as an entry-level administrator. Uh, but from that point forward, I thought that we had figured it out. Uh, I think that was the point the light bulb came on for him. Uh, we still talk pretty much every other day uh, to this point. Uh, we rehashed that story. We've shed some tears over that story. And I just tell him, and, and we both agree, we were both, we were both just thrilled uh, we were able to be there in that moment. And I think the fact that it still brings us to tears uh, shows you just how much it was right um, that we did it that way. But I, I think the world of James, I thought the world of him then, I thought he had every reason to thrive. And he has certainly done that um, since that since that happened five years ago. And those opportunities are so important, like you said, not just at that time, but for the rest of his life, as well as all the lives that he will impact. So it's so important to have people in positions like yours. Can you tell us a little bit about where the need is from a diversity perspective? Say, you know, for example, I know that there are some numbers on um, non-minority students and success rates. How do we bridge that gap and provide what students need to really go to the next level? I think that's a two-part answer to that. I think you have to know the institution or the system that you're in and what they really desire to have. 
Um, you know, you, you, you can aspire to do many wonderful things, but if the reality is that institution or that system is not equipped or doesn't desire that, uh, I think you might have some frustration. Uh, the other piece is when it comes to the numbers uh, of metrics and, and we can't uh, numbers and quantifiable data is great. Sometimes you need to lift your head up and look around at the actual environment and you can have uh, data that's great, but you could have a morale issue uh, and, and it could not be gleaned in the data, uh, you know, overall. Now, when it comes to uh, what diversity brings to education, it brings everything. It brings a uniqueness about you based on a number of things. If you're short, tall, skinny, the ethnicity, the race, uh, the gender, I mean, all kinds of different dynamics it brings. And I think that makes for a more prosperous uh, community. I think you have more dynamic uh, answers that you can provide based on your background. If everybody has the same background and the same process oriented approach to solutions, I think you're gonna have some pretty standard and expected results. But I think when you can uh, talk about the challenges, which are many right now in higher ed, I think it's powerful, uh, the more diverse you can be and, and, and how you attract the diversity to your respective institution, at least in higher ed. So how do you define diversity and inclusion? And when you do talk about DNI, do you include equity as well? I do. I do. I look at diversity as the differences that we each bring, and that could be along a number of lines. Uh, the inclusion is how we actively up, uh, act, how we actively uplift those differences to better the community we're a part of. And equity is certainly um, in play. I, I think you have to look above the fence line you're at. You have to realize if I'm seven foot tall, I'm already looking over the fence. But if you're five foot, maybe you need a boost, uh, respectively. But I think everybody should be on that level playing field. Uh, and there's been much discussion of is a playing field too level, is it not level enough? And uh, I think there are some choices that you have to make in the system you're in, uh, and then for me in higher ed, of where you're going to stand as an institution uh, when it comes to equity. Is it a conversation you want to have? Uh, and if you have, uh, how are you going to frame that out uh, for the rest of the world to see? Uh, which, quite frankly, can be uh, tricky, can be contentious. Uh, but I think you should be clear in your expectations uh, in, in diversity and inclusion in this space. And so a lot of people um, who don't know about the numbers, who don't know about DNI, they want to know why do we need to be so intentional? Why is it that when we're filling out paperwork, we need to say what nationality or what ethnicity we are? What are the steps and why are they so important? I think I think accountability can be uh, one of the first areas we can talk about. Uh, you know, if you're recruiting, let's say, students for university, and you want to have a certain percentage of that class to be diverse, uh, you can easily check in. And if you want to say it's 15% is what your what your mark would be, uh, hypothetically, and you're halfway through your recruiting cycle and you're only at 8%, it shows you you need to do work or something to to get near that goal. Um, I think also when you look at the space we're in. Um, you know, I, I think you have to figure out between the quantifiables, but also what are you trying to do uh, from your culture? I know we have a shifting dynamic or demographic here in the United States that's coming uh, in some time. And, and, you know, some institutions of higher ed in particular are already uh, looking ahead. Others perhaps might be um, not so inclined to really have that conversation now, um, which can be critical if you think of the longevity and the sustainability of that institution. You also have to think about the experience of the students coming in and are they gonna be better prepared for the world they're about to see based on what they've been through or are they gonna be less engaged and less likely to succeed because of something perhaps you could have controlled uh, with respect to diversity and inclusion. And so when we're talking about diversity and inclusion, are we only talking about the students? No, we're talking about all, all, um, all across the board. Uh, you know, I think when you think of in the classroom, the experiences you have with faculty and staff, uh, I think the, the operations staff that's around, if you think of your student athlete, how is their equity there? Um, and I think it's across the board. And I think sometimes we can get polarized or fixated on one area, Melanie, but I think at the same time, uh, you can get too deep in that pattern um, and be thriving in one area and then kind of not even be responsive in the next. And that's a pure leadership question. I think when it comes to the leadership, 
of, um, you know, how did you design that? What are you looking at? And uh, you have to make a choice there, uh, which is inevitable as well. So when we're talking about diversity and inclusion and improving things, for example, why does it make a difference in the lives of the students and staff? It's, it's, it's their livelihood. Uh, you know, you're, you're talking about trying to ensure that anybody in your campus culture will thrive. I have a saying that I don't think anybody sends their child or loved one or you want to work in a place that has that, that expects status quo. And I think we should be exhausting every single possibility we can to ensure that the, the students that we produce or we develop will thrive. And if we're going to sit here and look at the measures and the systems they go through and know perhaps that there are gaps that need to be addressed, you're also admitting that the product on the back end or how they're going to be developed has most likely some holes that will be in that. And so I think, you know, when you think of the atmosphere that we are releasing students into, we want them to have the best success, the best chances of success uh, that they can have. And I think that we need to work backwards in many ways and look at even how they were welcomed into the university community uh, four or five years later. What, how did that manifest itself? And quite frankly, the four or five year talk real quick. Are we looking at students for a four or five year project, which I hope that none of us in higher ed really would think that way. Uh, I look at it as a lifelong engagement opportunity uh, along the way of being their mentor and being their friend, um, helping in any way, which is at a minimum a privilege. You know, that that is an excellent point. It's not about the numbers now. It's kind of a forever thing. We go through so many stages in life and you brought up mentors. How have mentors had an impact in your life? Yeah, Melanie, I don't I don't know if I'd be on this call uh, without the mentorship I received and uh, the mentorship. I mean, if it's uh, Scott Lamy at UPMC, if President Bullock at CCAC, Dave Malone at Gateway Financial, uh, Kim Fleming, Heffron Tillerson, I just talked to her recently, um, you know, Greg Spencer and, and the list goes on and on. Evan Frazier. Uh, I love mentorship. I love being vulnerable with mentorship. I love not knowing what I don't know. Uh, but having the ability to pick up the phone. And uh, some people will go back and forth about mentorship. I'm absolutely uh, hit over heels about mentorship. It's been impactful uh, to me. It's made me a better husband, a better friend, a better father. It's certainly made me a better administrator. Knowing that I'm going to talk or knowing I can call somebody and they're handling a lot more than me and they've done it for a long time, but also knowing uh, they have my best interest in mind and my family. I think it's invaluable uh, to have those kind of people in your corner overall. Absolutely. And for the students watching, how do students go about connecting with these types of individuals who can really make an impact in their lives? You know, I, I think little things go a long way. Uh, I, have a, I have a personal trait where I write a handwritten note to anybody that I encounter. I learned that from a mentor um, about, you know, 12, 13 years ago. And I think it's different. I think, you know, the mentor, if I could use somebody, you know, Scott Lamb, who's at UPMC, we, we, we might get fixated on his position. And you have to think he's been doing it such a long time. And in between everything that he's done, he's just a, a, is a really acclaimed father and a husband. And so to talk about normal things in life, sometimes we have to remember that everybody has certain normal things that we all do, uh, if it's sports or re relaxation or, or whatever our hobbies. And I think so if you're new, you're a student and you're like, how can I really talk to him or her? Uh, they might welcome that chance. I, I get uh, so thrilled when I get an email that's a random email from a student that says, I simply want to stop in and say hello and get to know you. I actually had two call. I had two meetings this morning where that happened. And I think uh, it's critical. I think such moments, Melanie, are, they're pure. Uh, they let you really connect with somebody um, in so many ways. So. I'd say go for it. Email that person. If you're in a room, don't be scared to go over and introduce yourself. Uh, what you aspire to do. Uh, smile, be pleasant, uh, be polite, be thankful. Um, but I would also say to be honest uh, when you do that as well. That's great. Well, I think a lot of students were kind of where you were earlier, how you made the comment. You were like, oh, I wouldn't even have gotten a pizza. Um, so I think a lot of students, when they look at people like you or, you know, 
the director, the president, anything, they see this big gap. And this is something that we talk about a lot in these chats. Um, especially young people can be intimidated by high positions and things like that. So what do you have to say about, you know, kind of where you are in your career in comparison to as a student and how they can, you know, blend seamlessly to make that relationship worthwhile? Uh, the you can do a number of things. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, if you aspire to be an accountant, you know, there are tons of people in, in accountant uh, that are accountants in Pittsburgh uh, that would simply welcome, you know, you just to reach out. And, you know, it's a confidence. It's a confidence in knowing somebody's going to um, have your best interest in heart, uh, like I said earlier. So it's, um, it's important that you have people in your corner that can support you. Uh, many a times I've been surprised at meetings I've gotten and received, and even the mentor list I've talked to you about. I never uh, five, six years ago, uh, Ron Alvarado's in there as well. I mean, there's there's just so many people that I never would have thought that uh, I didn't know if they'd give me the time of day. And I, and I was a professional many years in at this point. Um, but I hope it's the approach to spirit, uh, maybe being seven foot tall. Uh, not only that had something to do with it as well. Um, but I think we share a lot of laughs. I like to laugh a lot. I like to smile a lot. Um, I like to just be present and I think students can learn a lot from just being present and uh, controlling what you can control. Well, and at the end of the day, we're all people, right? We're all kind of going through the same things with Corona and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, but we talked a little bit about mentorship, diversity. Once students do come through and they go through a diverse program or specifically, you know, minority students who have had your help and gone through, why do companies benefit from having more diversity in a graduating pool? Uh, you know, those students are adaptable. Uh, you know, I think students that have come through a rigorous dynamic uh, with diversity and inclusion in college or higher ed, uh, they have qualities about them that are going to add extreme value to your workplace. They're adaptable. Uh, they've been in mixed environments where they can they can really get things done. Um, they have the interpersonal skills and communications and they're resilient. I, you know, I tell students all the time, we can prepare you for the institution you're at, but we're also going to be realistic about what you face in this world and especially the current world that we're in. Uh, so for us, at a minimum, we talk about resiliency. We talk about love. We talk about uh, uh, being apologetic. Uh, if you're in a workplace and you do something that that isn't appropriate, um, you have time to correct those kind of things in college uh, a little bit more a rope, so to speak. But then when you get into the workplace, we want you to thrive. So be realistic, be a team player. Um, but, you know, coming in, we, we've we had some students go to Google. We've had other students, of course, uh, here at UPMC and BNY Mellon. Uh, the list goes on and on. And I can't tell you how many calls we get on the back end that say, hey, this student is just, you know, he or she hit the ground running, they fit in. And I say, well, we, we prepared them uh, to do just what they're doing. Uh, we're extremely gratified uh, that you're calling back. And I think if, if there's a polite pat on the back, uh, Melanie, that's 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 how it's done uh, when you see students thrive, which is just uh, simply gratifying in so many ways. Is I wanted to say, is that your favorite part of your job? Because when I'm hearing you speak, I can only imagine how those successes must feel for you. Yeah, you know, there's a lot that we don't with higher ed. And I think in this position, you know, being right under the president here, Father Paul uh, Taylor, who's tremendous, he's a tremendous mentor uh, to me in Pittsburgh. I don't think there's a greater good. I can't stop smiling thinking about students now, the two meetings I had this morning. Uh, that's what, you know, that's what revs my engine, I guess you can say, is uh, having them come in, uh, seeing a light bulb go on, or having them come through a difficult situation and seeing how they work through it and being here to help them. Um, that's at a minimum. I, I think we should all be able to do that. It doesn't matter what role you play, uh, inside or outside of higher ed. So how do you attract more diverse talent as far as staff and more diverse students? What is the process like for that? I think there's, you know, there's an intellectual process and then there's a personal. Uh, the intellectual will be systematic about things that you do. Is it, you know, is it uh, how you recruit students, the territories you go to? Uh, for me, I, you know, I think there's a blend. I think uh, if you look at uh, the great work we did at Duquesne to have a strategic plan, uh, to put some frameworks around it, to, to give appreciation to what uh, Duquesne has. And here at St. Vincent, I mean, there's just certain innate qualities here um, that we're going to be able to leverage and, of course, help our students. 
but you know, I think it, 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 you know, if I could go back to Duquesne, it, it, we, you know, we set a number of, of diverse uh, candidates and students that we wanted in. Uh, we set framework and how to retain them, uh, getting close to 90% freshman and sophomore retention for students of color in higher ed. Uh, we were able to do that at Duquesne. And then of course, on the back end with scholarship fundraising close to a million dollars and getting alumni involved, we had a really nice cycle of how we did that. That was intentional. And we had set that uh, we had set that course about four or five years ago, and uh, to see that come forward was validation. Um, but we knew we had a system that had active feedback. We knew we had a system if it was you know the diversity, so we were averaging nine percent uh, diversity in each class. And when we were left, it was an average of, of close to sixteen and a half percent. So we had done something in that space that showed us we were doing the right things. And then on the back end, you had those stories uh, from those employers. Uh, those are great signs. That is amazing. Well, what do you think that you did so differently from, you know, the previous administration or group that was there that made that huge of a difference? I mean, that's tremendous. And I think it was tremendous. Yeah, it was, it was tremendous. And I think that was it was a, there was an avenue for us to move full steam ahead and not give appreciation to those who had been before me. And uh, I'm very appreciative of who set the foundation for you that you're on. And somebody set the foundation, obviously, Melanie, for you, for you and me both. Somebody's done that. Um, but I think there was an opportunity. I think when you're a leader, uh, you have an opportunity to craft things and create things uh, that could be different. And I think at times that might be lonely, um, but you have to believe in yourself. You have to communicate it widely. Uh, I think you have to be dynamic in many ways, but you also have to know uh, the reality. Uh, of what you're facing. And I think for what we did at Duquesne, and it's, of course, being in this region, um, I think it was nothing short of tremendous uh, when we look back on it. And um, for us, you know, when, when people say or, or thought that things wouldn't work, it, it actually gave us more energy to make sure they would work. Um, and a simple question at the end of the day was, did it add value to our students? And it didn't matter what engagement we were doing, if it was a charity basketball game, which I'm still sore from uh, many, many, many months later, or if it was, you know, talking to a corporation, we were the same and we were the same in each space about what we were trying to do and who we were and uh, did it add value to our students. Obviously with the basketball game, the tremendous success of student scholarships, it was a no brainer uh, to be there and support that. It had nothing to do with Duquesne. It was about, you know, students need this. And what is the importance of scholarships, especially for the diverse student population? You know, I think sometimes I, I, I in a loose way, as a humble way, uh, you don't know what students have been through um, to get to, to you, uh, at least in higher ed. Uh, you know, I don't speculate on what they've been through. Obviously, time will reveal what they've been through. I just, you know, you want equity. You want every student to have uh, a platform where they can succeed. And there's many a stories that if I, if I personally would not have taken the time, I would have never known uh, what the students came through, uh, the adversity. And I would have known that some of them didn't have adverse conditions they had to get through to get there. And so I think sometimes we have a tendency to look at student scholarships as if somebody's getting a much more tremendous boost or bigger one than others. And, and, and there might be cases where that's happened. I, I think for us, at least when we could control student scholarships and we could drill it down um, to what that impacted, I think it was critical. And I think we could see the proof of what that did to students because a student sitting across from me or you that has a $3,000 bill, regardless of the conversation we have, they're still going to need to find a way to navigate that. And I don't think it's fair to let them sleep overnight or, or sleep on things that we could potentially control and help them out with. So what do you think would be your advice for someone who wants to take the path that you're on, students who are interested in diversity and inclusion, both corporate and educational, what would you tell them about number one, the educational path they'll take, and two, on a personal level? I think the educational path, uh, Melanie, you, you, you have to figure that out. And uh, in the educational path, we sometimes have a tendency in higher ed um, to tell you about the highlights, but we also sometimes need to do a better job of, of enlightening you about your sense of belonging in the space, about the challenges that you will um, encounter uh, early on, and about how we're there to help you through those challenges. 
And I think just as much as we talk about the educational goods, we should talk about areas where we need to get better. So the educational path is a number of tools and a career center, a number of, of, of techniques and conversations you can have that will determine your fit educationally. Uh, I think you're going to have to have some kind of recourse debt, some debt, I mean, meaning that you need to owe back. Um, you know, some of that is just where we are right now, at least in the space that I'm in. Uh, professionally, uh, the opportunities are endless. And I would say anytime you're in a professional arena, obviously with the Hispanic Chamber of, of Pittsburgh, if there's a networking event you can go to, if there's a mistake that I made, I think as an undergrad, I wish I was more active in events that were hosted. Uh, socially. And you can take a uh, great advantage of those uh, in many ways and meet some wonderful people, uh, quite frankly, that'll probably be your mentors uh, in a process. Well, I'm sure that you are a mentor to so many students. Do you want to tell us a little bit about maybe another mentoring story that you have? Yeah, uh, you know, for me, um, you know, there were three pharmacists that graduated from Duquesne uh, a year ago, and they were, uh, I know, I'd, you know, I'd come across them as freshmen and knew uh, with their journey into sciences, it would be extremely difficult. And quite frankly, we were, um, you know, we made time to make sure we were available and, and certain majors obviously dictated more out of you. And I think to see what they had done, I think to see uh, them go through, um, that whole journey and the process and to write their letters are all gainfully employed by some major uh, pharmaceutical corporations. Uh, that's one story. The other story I'll share real quick is something that we did at Woodland Hills uh, School District. And colleges have a tendency, uh, Melanie, to go from, they're always in the ninth through 12th range in high schools because they're recruiting, they're doing certain things. We decided on a whim one time to uh, start to mentor uh, fourth and fifth graders at Woodland Hills. We got a random call from a, from a teacher and we did it. And we went out uh, weekly. I went out for a very long time, for about a month. And then we, the students went out on our own. Uh, they had kind of uh, had a pattern going. Uh, we didn't know we were mentoring, but underneath that, the students were ballroom dancing. They were learning to ballroom oh. dance. And so a random Friday, and it was May 5th of uh, four years ago, I, I remember it distinctly. We got an invite, and it, it just said, you need to be here at 5 o'clock on a Friday. And you know college students. These college students were great, so I had no issues with them. They, they were actually going to be there at 5.30 on a Friday. Uh, it was their culmination. It was a culmination, so they actually had a performance in a cafeteria. Uh, I remember, most importantly from that, is that the parents came up to the kids and, and, and myself, uh, the student, the Duquesne students, and said, you will have no idea of what you've done. You know, they said not only at school, but at home. They say, hey, this student, you know, he's 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 acting up less. Uh, in school, there was a story the principal shared uh, that really is touching to me. She said it was a student that was in trouble, and she saw the other another student come by that was in ballroom dancing, and she brought him in, and and she said the principal said I didn't have to say anything. She said that they started interacting with each other, and one said to the other, if you don't act right, uh, Malcolm and Kyle aren't coming this Friday, and he says you know how upset I'll be because of that. And so she didn't have to say anything. They kind of communicated with each other and uh, they had no issues. But I love that story. I think that's, uh, you know, we were college students and college administrators, you know, uh, mentoring fourth grade, fourth and fifth graders. It was great. Oh, uh, well, it seems like it's really come full circle for you, for you, because as a student, you had mentors and then as a professional, now you've mentored at, you know, the grade school level, the college level. Yeah. What do you have to say about the importance of these educational institutions and them actually creating intentional mentorship programs specifically towards diversity and inclusion? You know, I'd be remiss to say there's not a bottom line to it. You know, I think when you look at retention, when you think of recruitment, uh, there is a bottom line on how do you retain students? Uh, I think that's pretty uh, simple to understand that a student who has a good experience will most likely continue through uh, their progression. I think there's a human element and values uh, standpoint that we shouldn't forget about. And, you know, students right now, they deserve support. Uh, they need support. Uh, they need to know that somebody will stand with them. And sometimes they don't need a lot of help. They just need a reassurance or even the thought that you're gonna be there. So 
with diverse students in particular, uh, there's so many things that most of them might have encountered before they've come to you. Um, and there could be associated traumas with that. Uh, there could be associated uh, self-confidence issues where they don't know if they can make it and it doesn't come out uh, on top, uh, but it could be it could be lying there underneath. And there's a lot of worry too, right? There's worry and concern from families that have sent their child uh, to you about how they're going to be, are they going to be safety, are they safe, are they going to be secure, are they going to develop? Um, and so I think we need to do what we can do. I mean, if, if we know that certain um, students of a minority class are going to be marginalized or, it's, or they have a higher likelihood of not making it, uh, I think colleges and institutions should have some kind of mentoring framework at a minimum uh, coming in. Definitely. I um, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I actually had the Board of Governors scholarship. Um, so I came in and I was also put in a mentoring program and I was really involved with the administration and it made a huge difference in my college experience and definitely after college as well. So for those students who are listening, reach out to people like Jeff, reach out to your administration. It, it can change your life for the better, for sure. <laughs> And Melanie, they should reach out to you. I can vividly recall we had a meeting at Duquesne. I mean, I think it was uh, three or four months ago at this point, right? Probably longer than that. But uh, the students, they loved it. And I think just opening your space to other people to come in and not knowing that you need to be a dominant voice, um, but that it empowers, it empowers students. I remember the students after you left, I think Jesus was there as well, another one of your directors. And it was uh, just outstanding. The energy uh, that you guys brought to the space uh, was palpable uh, for at least the next couple of days, which was great. Oh, that's so amazing to know. And, you know, I think that that's so important. I think more professionals need to do that, to just actually go in into the schools and talk about what you're doing. You know, that's part of why we do this series. I know I kind of say this every time. You guys might be getting tired of it, but it's about putting a face to a name and a position and learning where people come from and what they've been through. Um, we've all been through a lot, but we are all human and we can all talk to each other and care about each other. And that's one of the things that I really see in you and your whole story is no matter what it is, you're always putting people first. Um, can you just talk as we're wrapping up a little bit about why that's so important in your life and your technique of everything that you do? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's extremely important. Um, uh, you know, the, the mentorship piece, I, I'll, I'll be frank. I don't expect anything from a uh, mentor. I mean, I don't expect anything, you know, tangibly. I, I think if somebody can give you their time, um, I just, I always say it's an honor if somebody can give you time to craft a relationship with you. And I'll, I'll go back to everybody who deserves your best. Um, I have an analogy where I say, you know, if you took your business card and you ripped it up every day, who would you be? And uh, I would dare to say a lot of people would be different. Um, but I, you know, I, it's humble. It's humbling to be in a space, especially the one I'm in now, uh, to, to enact change. It's humbling to be present for somebody. It's humbling to be called upon. I mean, some people don't like to be emailed and called a lot. I think it's great, uh, quite frankly, to be overwhelmed. It's, it shows you that there's something you can give somebody. And um, I think a lot, a lot more of the world needs that is what I would say. I agree. And I think that students get that from people like you, especially when you have these meaningful and positive interactions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're getting towards the end of our time. I I just want to go through really quick some of the things we talked about. Um, we talked about the importance of sports in the lives of children, um, education, mentoring, diversity and inclusion, and of course, putting people first. Um, is there anything that you want to say about any of those topics before we wrap up? Yeah, I, I, I would mention, I think the last point is, uh, you know, I'm on quite a few board of directors and, and, and I'm involved with quite a few nonprofits. You know, give back when you can. And, you know, we coach on the side and, we, you know, we, we coach some youth. So just get back. And, and to you students in particular, I just love to relay the message of not looking at yourself as a deficit. Uh, there are things that perhaps you don't really know at this age. Uh, just know that people like me and Melanie and, and other people in this world, especially in Pittsburgh, will help you. Uh, you know, if, if you reach out, if you email, uh, the craziest request that you might have is not that crazy. Um, when it comes to people that truly want to help you. So 
Uh, if you're on a fence, make that call, shoot that email, um, do what you need to do so you can get the help that you deserve. Absolutely. And while that's not always easy, like you said, even though it might seem like a big deal, it's definitely not. <laughs> um, well, Jeff, I want to for joining us. This has been really nice. Um, there might be some comments and questions um, that I'm sure we'll be following up with later. We'll be sharing an email with all of Jeff's information. Um, Jeff, thank you again for joining us. And thank you guys all for watching. It's been great to have you tune in. We've been getting a lot of questions, a lot of emails about people who want to become speakers. You are more than welcome. Um, the, digital, the digital speaker series of Latino Pittsburgh is an initiative of the Pittsburgh Metropolitan Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Our goals are to share relevant information, inspire growth, and foster opportunity. Speakers include community leaders and members, as well as other individuals who have had a positive impact, not only on the Hispanic community, but the Pittsburgh community at large. Next week, we're going to be talking to um, someone who I find to be extremely inspirational. A lot of you might know her. She's on our board, Yvonne Campos. She founded Campos Market Research, um, which is a company that she sold. She's on a ton of boards, but more recently, she also founded the Next Act Fund which is a women's angel investment fund here in Pittsburgh. They're making a huge positive difference. They're funding um, small businesses, um, medium businesses, and they have all women investors. So that's something you might want to check out next week. Thank you for joining us again, and we hope to see you soon. To learn more, visit www.pmahcc.org. See you next week. Don't forget to subscribe.